where does the seed for, for the passion that you have come from if you you know reflect I think a lot of my passion comes from rage actually there's always like a fire burning everybody wants you to be perfect but when you actually are ambitious and passionate then they say no 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 that's that's too much i can see what effect i have on my kids i can see how they react to things you know that kind of constant mirror is um a gift and a curse right because you really you really get to know what kind of person you are i actively chose you know being an artist cuz i i wanted to live in the world as an artist i wanted to i wanted to have a world view of an artist so i kind of had to like craft that for myself thank you for coming and i'm very excited it took a few chasing you down to bring you here and i'm very excited <laughs> i know schedules with multiple time zones it can be a challenge <laughs> No also I know that you you know you to take this summer off and you know you slow things down I was seeing your mural and it was fantastic and I was like you know maybe yeah I think it probably now is the best time you've had a good rest and how are you feeling now Great so glad to be back in routine and yeah I am a big believer in sabbaticals and taking taking a break from you know certain types of work for seasons so I love that. And this I'm I'm going to ask you my first question from here. And then we'll, you know, you're someone also who does multiple things and I'm also going to ask this for my own self more than anyone else, you know. You have the Tribe Network, you have your own podcast, um you have your own practice, and I think you also do all of these things with a lot of effort and, you know, very beautifully. How does it feel like um how do you deal with and social media of course? How do you deal with overwhelm? Um to when you're doing like multiple things and tossing between multiple projects and as you know I think as artist even though we want to do multiple things but also equally focus on what we're doing do it with you know more attention and love how do you how do you navigate that um i think for me it's about identifying what causes overwhelm um having a large to-do list doesn't necessarily cause me overwhelm or drain my energy um i which is not to say that i don't feel overwhelmed but i think um i think it's more than that you know more than just having a large to-do list um one of the one of the ways that i do feel overwhelmed is when i am often exerting myself too much so when i'm sharing too much of my energy with others um whether that's like in community building or in conversation and so one of the ways that i fight overwhelm is to make sure i have a couple days or even one day um where i'm not really talking that much to people just to kind of move inward and and tackle some things um i think Yeah, it it's less about, you know, what I have on my plate and more about kind of evaluating my mental health and my energy levels and making sure I'm like giving myself the space that I need um to move in and out of all of those projects and spaces. But you are not only all of those things, but you're also a mother. And I'm sure as a mother you do not get any vacation. There's no leave a day on that. There's not but my kids are in school full time. So, you know, I have from 8 to 3 basically to myself which um you know, I've only I've only had that schedule for a year and so it still feels very much like a gift rather than just an expectation. <laughs> so you are someone who's really passionate like, you know, I we I think we have very similar missions except you're a mother and I'm not. get um i'm going to ask you something how this is a very raw question you know how did change did something change for you when you became a mother um as an artist uh did you have um you know traditionally a lot of artists uh feel scared not only artists i think in general women uh no matter where 
what part of the world that we live in, no matter what we're doing. But often uh, we feel like Madrut is going to take away time. It could take away, it could bring more responsibilities and it could become, you know, it could, if not hold you back, but maybe slow you down. Did you have those fears while you were, um, you know, when you were there? And um, how did you, what were your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I definitely had, you know, fears and anxieties around being a mother, but, um, and and this is a question that I often ask people that I interview on the Artist Mother podcast. But for me, um, my journey was a little bit different because I wasn't, I wouldn't call myself an artist until after I was already a mother. So that kind of the traditional sort of going to art school and going to grad school and doing all of those things, like building your career before you become a parent. Um, that wasn't part of my story. I, I actually already had a kid when I went to grad school and chose to kind of be an artist and focus on visual art and painting. Um, so there, there wasn't quite that jarring, like separation of identity for me. It was, it was kind of already baked in the cake, if you will. Um, and I, which is not to say that that doesn't present its own challenges, but I've, I've kind of always had to carve out my, my art career, you know, in the midst of motherhood rather than adding it on after that identity and that foundation was established. You know, um, before we go into it, let's also talk a little bit about the beginning of your, so that we can connect the dots. Um, how, how did you get into the arts? And then we'll speak about how, how has it, how does it feel different in both the worlds today? How did you get into the arts? What, what was your journey? How did you begin? Um, well, I think I would have gotten into the arts much earlier, but I went to a very small private school and you had to choose between mu music and art. Um, they only offered those things at the same time just because of like understaffing and, you know, underfunding. And I mean, I graduated with a school, with a class of 36 people. So it was a very small school. Um, <clears throat> and so I actually remember wanting to go to you know, the visual art class, but all of my friends were in a choir and I liked to sing. So I, I chose kind of music as my path and really never thought about art again as like an option for me until, um, I was in college and I had chosen, um, <clears throat> education, elementary education as kind of my college path and got into the classroom and found myself very unhappy and, um, you know, not, not wanting to spend every day of my life kind of around fourth graders. Um, so at that point I had, you know, gained an interest in photography and was working in a coffee shop and decided to buy a camera and realized like maybe I could maybe I could switch my major to something that would connect me to this like hobby or this interest rather than you know this like career path um that I thought I was on so I ended up switching my major to communications because I was kind of too late um I was too close to graduation to switch to art, but I took as, as many art classes as I could. Um, and that kind of got me started. I ended up starting a commercial photography business and did wedding and portrait photography um, for years, which I learned a lot of marketing and PR skills. The real life skills. Yeah, doing that business. And then, you know, eventually that also wasn't, you know, wasn't art enough for me. So yeah. I, oh, I get that. <laughs> yeah. I kind of swung even further away from a traditional quote unquote career and, you know, went back to grad school for painting. What was your first thing and something like, did you, um, as okay, you felt like, okay, now I feel like an artist. Yeah. I mean, I think 
I think I I wanted, you know, that capital A artist title, but I didn't really know I didn't I didn't have a lot of models for what that would look like. Um and and that's why I chose the grad school path because I felt like I needed a structure to kind of lean into that would give me a a foundation like that would help me build that foundation that I was missing and and I'm certainly not one to to necessarily recommend grad school I don't think it's for everybody um especially now like that was in 2015 and even now there's so much more visibility for art careers and different paths artists can take. Um, but I was living very rurally. I didn't have an arts community. I didn't see people, you know, every day. So, um, yeah, so I, I, I went to grad school and that was kind of, kind of my, my commitment to, okay, now I'm choosing this path. Um, which is, is interesting because I think a lot of artists feel like art chose them. Like it was something that they just had to do. They had to make art. They always felt this like compulsion. And um, that that wasn't really true for me. I I actively chose, you know, being an artist because I, I wanted to live in the world as an artist. I wanted to I wanted to have a world view of an artist. So I kind of had to like craft that for myself. Did you have your fears? Um, you know, also like you said, you also grew up rurally at that point and also not have like, let's say a role model, someone who would, you know, okay, this is a successful person. This is someone who does what I like and probably I want to be like this person. Um, at a point like that, um, did you have your fears about, okay, I may do this, but can I make a career out of this? Can this be something that I can do for a living? Did you have those questions or you were like, okay, I want to do this, but I don't know where this would go. Um, I definitely had those questions. I think uh, where my partner and I were living at the time afforded a bit more flexibility. We were living very rurally and in a location where Basically, most of our expenses were covered by my husband's job. Um, he's a college professor, so he he doesn't make much money, but we were living in a place where it was very cheap to live. We had bought a house for very cheap and we're fixing it up. And um, so we kind of really scaled back our lifestyle in order to allow that flexibility for me. Um, you know, we weren't reliant on me, me making money and that, that like, you know, I, I think there's something to be said for the pressure to make money because, you know, when you're living in a place where you need to make money, like you, you figure out how to do it, right? You, yeah, you, you has, you know, you pull things together. Yeah. And, you know, for me, I think, I, I didn't have the same pressure. I, I had like a little bit more time so things could build a, a bit more organically. And that, that really led to like a lot of surprises and, um, just kind of following, uh, following, you know, the flow of the community and following the flow of my career path. Um, which, you know, I, I don't take for granted. Like I realize that's a very privileged, um, way to go about building a career. But tell me something, even at that point, were you someone who was very passionate about what you're like, you know, not only community, I would say, but womanhood, motherhood, um, being a woman, that the female perspective, uh, or it just, um, at what point I feel like, because, you know, I feel in my own experience also, um, I feel like growing up in a, up in a patriarchal setup, um, looking at how women are treated very passively also um, in the society where I grew up, I think that really ingrained that thought for me. And I felt like day by day, I was just building on that. I never intended to have my art or my community or anything on those lines, but it always felt something that was so true to my bones. I knew that I couldn't hold myself back. Do you think um, 
how where does the seed for for the passion that you have come from if you you know reflect hmm i was i was actually just referring to something related to this in a conversation with a friend last night um i think a lot of my passion comes from rage actually um i i don't know if you've heard of the enneagram but, but it's a like a personality type um system and yeah and certain numbers are kind of oriented around anger and rage and um, I definitely feel anger very strongly. Um, it, it's a, like an emotion that's very easy to access for me. Um, but but I was talking with a friend last night that I think the the high side of that is that I have a lot of passion, you know, just like it naturally. Um, it pushes you. Yeah, like I, I just kind of am fueled, you know, there's always like a fire burning, you know, there's, there's always something... Um, that I want to fix something that I want to do. Um, and I think a lot of times I feel as a, as a woman and as a mother, I feel like ashamed of that ambition because, you know, I think we, we kind of get the impression that there's a specific way that we're supposed to be in the world. Um, we're not supposed to do too much, you know, because then, well, things must be falling apart at home or, you know, we must be, be neglecting our kids if we have a good career or, um, you know, like everybody wants you to be perfect, but when you actually are ambitious and passionate, then they say, no, 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 that's, that's too much, you know? So when did you start having these thoughts? Was it, um, was it like since like, you know, growing up or was it, I don't know, I'm just trying to understand, um, where did you pick up this and it became, how did it grow into what you are today? Um, I think probably in high school, um, you know, just, just kind of wanting to be everything to everybody and wanting, wanting to be an athlete and be a good student and be artistic and sing and, you know, and also feeling like maybe it's not okay to pursue so many things at once, like kind of having some insecurity uh, are about that. Um, yeah, I, I think probably in high school and, you know, kind of having like your parents' expectations that you're trying to live up to and at the same time, finding your own identity. And let's say once you figured this feeling out, how did it crystallize into, you know, did you, um, what kind of, let's start with what kind of work that you started making so that we can, you know, um, navigate our ways through that. Um, did you start, um, how did you start painting or making as, you know, just as we, you know, as artists start? Um, yeah, so I applied to grad school with some work that I was making that was combining photography and painting. Um, it it was not very good. Uh, <laughs> I look I look back on it now, and you know I'm like, what was I thinking? How did I ever get into this school? But um, thankfully, I did. And yeah, I you know I was very inspired by. Um, abstract painters like Joan Mitchell and Lee Krasner and Helen Frankenthaler and kind of this like Abex um, legacy of women painters who, you know, didn't get like the fame and the fortune at the time, but were making the big work anyway. And, um, you know, that, that was kind of the, the vision that I, had um for my work and and my you know my work has really changed over time um i spent you know many years really just focusing on painting um particularly with acrylics and water-based medium because i was working in a home studio and had kids around um and then eventually 
my work now has transitioned to include textiles. So um, my work really combines painting and sewing and textile. Um, you know, it, it's mixed media, but part of that integration of textiles into my work and sewing practices was also influenced by motherhood of just having access to more materials more often and um, having a practice that can kind of be picked up and put down quickly. Um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely transit transitions over time um, because of kind of the lifestyle that I have. Did you um, tell me I was speaking to someone you know, only today and we was we were talking about transitions in work while you know as artists we're taught the idea that we can have one style all our life we can be known we should be known um whereas as artists ourselves we know how monotonous and how boxing that could feel and how it is so necessary for us to keep pushing the envelope once we feel like okay i figured this out i've done this what next but the the place of what next and you know you moving away from moving away in the sense of you know transitioning and evolving to textiles um did that in any way um you know i remember when i was my biggest fear i didn't incorporate i come from fashion i loved embroideries always never incorporated in the beginning because i had this concept that i didn't want to be too crafty i didn't want to be too you know i wanted to be an artist um with a capital A. And I remember I was always boxed at, oh, you're a designer, oh, you come from fashion, oh, you're not, a, this is not British, fine art. And there was a very specific way of being a fine artist. And I'd, I'd been working in the commercial arts and design that I didn't want to do this, you know, commercial and so much. So I was so afraid to, um, to run out of that um, traditional method. And only when I, you know, figured, okay, I felt safe enough. And I was like, I think only between like, you know, in COVID, I started to um, just because I didn't have enough influence around me, I started to work with embroideries. And that led me to, you know, my work today. But I did have a lot of, um, you know, this cultural thing like, okay, am I, is it too crafty? Is it art enough? Is it not enough? Did you have those questions? Um, definitely not, not so much the craft. Uh, I've always been interested in mixed media work and work that incorporated like found material. So that part of the conversation, I don't know if I just didn't hear, you know, a lot of the critique around craft, quote unquote craft work, but I, I didn't like buy into that as much. For me, it was it was more that I felt like if I were to incorporate textiles and specifically um, quilts, and you know, kind of let the legacy of quilting influence my practice, that I needed like a story about a grandma who taught me how to quilt. Like that was kind of it. Seemed like every it seemed like every artist I knew who had that, it was like, well, yeah, I learned how to quilt from Aunt Mabel or, you know, um, and so that was kind of like my insecurity was I felt like I, I never had somebody teaching me this thing. So it wasn't right for me to kind of bring it into my, my repertoire. You figured this on your own. Well, actually I, I, you know, I went ahead and, and started quilting anyway and then come to find out my great grandmother was, was like this epic quilter. Um, and I, I have some of her quilts now and I, you know, my aunt like pulled out all these quilts and showed them to me. And she actually had a little quilt studio in, in the farmhouse, you know, and so I'm, I'm obviously like, it's really nice to kind of wrap up that story with, with that realization, but I'm, I'm glad that I didn't let that hold me back, you know, that, that I didn't, that I didn't say I don't have the like qualifications to kind of bring this. Cause what qualifications do I have to be a painter? Like, you know, I'm a white girl from rural America. Like there's no painting legacy in my history. And yet this is still a medium that 
is calling to me and that I want to work with. Okay, tell me something. Then you started, not only you, of course, we've spoken about your career as an artist, but then you're another part that I also feel like, you know, I feel like as artists, one way of specifically people like us who have extended our studio practice and our practice is way beyond just being in the studio, building communities, being with people. Um, at what point, first, I will, I want to ask you what led you to create Thrive and being in a, like, you know, having these um because it's, it is for sure not easy it is very overwhelming with having children and being your you know taking your own practice it really needs a lot of um dedication and passion what was your driving force to start you know being in community and start community building and have tri- thrive well um So the Thrive Together Network is a collaboration with uh, Jamie Smith, um, my business partner in Vancouver, Canada, and I'm based in the States. And Jamie and I actually combined our communities and our businesses after I had started the Artist Mother podcast and, you know, kind of grew a community online and had, um, you know, had folks who were in like programming that I was offering and and different things. Um, and, you know, we made the decision to, to combine our communities and our businesses because I, I just couldn't do it on my own, you know? And and I think Jamie too, like it, it's very hard. I mean, you know, this, like, it's very hard to do the work of community building and it's even harder to do that work when you're doing it alone, you know, when it's, when it's just kind of your vision and, and having a business partner is very different than just hiring people to work for you because when you're still the only kind of driver, it's like having a co-pilot. Yeah. And, you know, I think that really frees up like mental space, which you can lean um, on to each other. You don't have to drive everything yourself and let everybody lean on to you. Yeah. So I, I started the artist mother podcast, um, back in, well, I started producing the podcast in 2018. We released episodes in February of 2019. And, you know, that was really, uh, back to this idea about just not having models and visibility, you know, living in a rural community. I just, I didn't know artists and I especially didn't know artists who were parents and I didn't know how people were making it work. Like, like day to day, not, yeah, not yeah. like questions about how do you get a gallery to notice you? Like, I, I didn't even really care about questions like that at the time. I, I just wanted to know, how are you structuring your day? Like, how are you, yeah. how are you making work that is bigger and beyond just the nap time hours, you know, like, are your kids, do you have childcare? How are you paying for that childcare? Just, I kind of really yeah. wanted to know the, the logistics. Of, yeah. Of how people were structuring their life. And, um, and so that's why I started the podcast. Um, cause I just, I, I needed some questions answered. I needed to figure it out, you know? And of course there was, hundreds of other people out there who had the same questions who were wondering, you know, and people even who have more established careers, I think there's still just kind of this question about, am I, am I doing this in a way that like is bringing me joy? Is this best for my family? Um, You know, like it's really good to hear how other people are doing it and either draw inspiration from that, maybe make tweaks to your own practice and process. And I think also knowing sense of belongingness, I think even if you're all all our unique ways, just knowing that, okay, I I remember like, um, I don't know, I was very alone and um, a lot of things that I thought at that point that I was messed up, that I didn't know enough or I wasn't doing enough. And quickly when I started to speak to people and realize, okay, this is just not a me problem. This is a generalized and I'm not alone. And somebody's gone through this and maybe I will find my own way. But just knowing that, okay, what I'm experiencing is is a collective experience, I think really helped me. Yeah, that visibility, that sharing stories and that 
podcasting specifically can provide, um, I think is just priceless. Yeah. Okay. So tell me something. Okay. This is a tricky one. I really want to hear your thoughts about this though. You've done, um, the other way you became a mother and then you let and created your career path as an artist. What do you think was your biggest, um, strength what did really help you on this path in this process being a mother and choosing to be an artist then on the contrary to let's say vice versa hmm i think um you know i i didn't have to go through a big transition um kind of giving up eight hour days in the studio. Like I, I never had that. So, so you think you made your own plan as per account around your children since the beginning? Yeah, that integration was already there. So my career, you know, it really has, I, I, I have the expectation that my career will, will sort of always be flexible. Um, you know, I don't have like a rigidity to, my practice that I think other, other artists have, particularly artists who, you know, were trained kind of in old school ways of, of being methods. Um, so I, I don't have as much like dismantling of all of those rules around being an artist to do. Um, I think that's a pretty big strength, you know, there's, there's kind of always been this like rogue way that I've gone about this because that's all I had to work with, you know? And also I think getting crafty, I think once you don't know the rules and you are like, okay, I get to figure this out on my own. So you never know if you're doing right or wrong. You just know you're doing, as long as you're doing something, I think that's like, okay, at least I'm taking one step. At least I'm doing something, if not the right thing. Yeah. So I guess like adaptability maybe is kind of the strength that we're talking about and, you know, resilience, like just always, I'm, I mean, I'm always going to make the work, even if it takes me longer than I thought, or if I have to change the method kind of thing. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I like that. Good positive way to spin it. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you think was um, the hardest part for you navigating um, the difficult part of this process? I think, you know, speaking very vulnerably, I think feeling like I, you know, I think the number one thing that helps artists grow their career is time right? Putting, just putting the time in. And I think for me, I've seen a bit of a slower evolution with my work because not for lack of wanting, but I just, I haven't, I, I don't have 40 hours a week to put into my practice. However, I don't think that, and I'm not speaking for myself, but I, I don't think spending a lot of time on work equals great work. That's not what I'm saying, but I think in terms of the career growth and the trajectory of my career, you know, those things just take a lot of time to develop. And I think that's been the biggest challenge for me is just feeling like, you know, maybe something that took me 10 years to accomplish would have taken an artist with a different lifestyle only six years, you know? Um, and so kind of, just being patient and remembering that, you know, I, I hope to be making art my whole life. So that's okay. Yeah. I, this isn't like a, a one time thing. And I think, you know, um, I remember I was listening to a video and I really like what he said is like, you have, um, your career, how fast you want to go, how much successful you want to be and how much life you want to live. These are three tangents and you can have two at a time. If you want to live a life and 
if you want to let's say you want more success then your time is going to be the biggest compromise if you do not you know so what he was trying to say was if um if you want to build a sustainable and if you want to have control over your time and you want to have a life be ready because this is going to be like building blocks it's not going to be a skyrocket versus if you want to go okay you're like i want to do this all in and like i don't care what i have to do it and you give up everything so you compromise your sanity and like you oh you know all of those things and you can find that uh, jump and increase and or leap whatever we can call it so i think we all have our own ways and i also think it is sometimes it is also season where you know okay you can take a few leaps and you can go rogue you can have that imbalance but then you know if you're someone who likes to have and i think more than a lot of artists like grounding and having that kind of uh, sustainability i think is also essential for our careers yeah i need that uh the book or podcast that you reference cuz that's a great analogy i think one of the ways that i think about it you know which is a little bit cliche in like the artist mother community is that you can only wear so many hats at a time you know like we feel like we're we have 10 hats to wear but really you know you can't wear 10 hats at once like you can only kind of shift through a couple like you can only prioritize a couple things at a time if you're going to do them with integrity and you're going to do them well you know and so we're kind of always making these choices about what's important to us um but i like the way that you know that person framed the idea of time just being one of those resources you know and 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 we we don't have unlimited time for everything so it it becomes either super fast paced or you know we allow ourselves kind of uh the luxury of experiencing time at a at a at a slower rate um and i totally agree with you that it's very seasonal it's it's um you know i don't i don't want to go all out all the time that's why i take sabbatical and why i don't answer emails like on the weekends and you know i i want to like have these spaces in my life where i'm kind of moving in and out of um you know modes of being how how uh now you you're not like an early mother i mean you 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 have your own experience how do you think um all these years of motherhood um has that impacted you um as an artist and also as someone you know who is so passionate about building a community that is centered around bringing mothers women you know all of us together um i think your kids really offer you a good mirror of yourself so <laughs> uh better for better or worse um i think th- i've i think through motherhood i've really come to know myself um in ways that before i had kids i don't think i always really understood like how i was showing up in the world and I f- I feel like because I can see I can see what effect I have on my kids I can see how they react to things you know that kind of constant mirror is um a gift and a curse right because you really you really get to know what kind of person you are um which I think has helped in community building because you know community building is um it requires a lot of energy and a lot of attention and um a lot of a lot of work and yeah i think just like understanding my limits has been really helpful in that i love that i think that's a really good point it's it's scary too though <laughs> i don't have kids but um in the past two years i you know we have two children in the house i have a nephew and a niece and you know i spend a lot of my time and i think something that um having being around kids and loving kids and having kids in your life also makes you um i think another skill set or i think the advantage i feel personally is you know you become really conscious of your choices in the sense of you know it i think 
you know if you're really taking away time from that it really needs to meet some mean something and you're not really i think um just doing things for the sake of doing you really um need to know that okay if i'm going to do this i really need a nice reason in the sense of you know that this you're very conscious of your choices i think and i think that also brings around that awareness about okay who you are does this really matter to me and you know things like that yeah that's a great point and i totally agree that um you know i i want to i want my kids to like see me happy and enjoying my life and putting putting my passions to use in things that i really care about too like i you know i i want them to know that like you don't have to have a job just to have a job like you you know you you'd probably do at certain stages of your life but you can also um you know you can also figure out ways to to spend your time because you just love something and you, and you want to do it you know i i want them to to know that that's okay and to see me um you know to see me spending my time and energy on things that bring me joy and are valuable to me um but yeah like you said you know again i was just having a conversation with somebody this week about how there's just only so much time in the day and you know when you have kids around you can't you can't do everything that you're passionate about like you're kind of always making compromises and so if you you know if you if you really want to be an artist like that has to be one of the higher priorities on your yeah. list you know yeah and you know um tell me something i i've heard this around um um with a lot of mothers and i think how much are your kids involved in let's say in your creative practice did you in the beginning had that pressure in the sense of okay um you know should you bring the studio uh, kids in the studio do they have to be participative or are they today what was how did you navigate that um it worked really well when i just had one kid but <laughs> Uh you know I have all these pictures of my oldest in the studio with me and he he also was just a a different kid than my my other two he was very independent and you know good just with a book and a you know a place to sit um so he he uh had a lot of patience for my studio time and my my practice um I think you know as soon as there were more than one kid <laughs> hanging around like it yeah it was like <laughs> no this is not possible um and, and I really admire parents who specifically who make work like with their children and not necessarily like I'm letting my kids paint on my canvas but more conceptually like kind of using you know rituals and routines and um conversations that they're having within their home to kind of inspire their artwork like i th- i think that is really interesting and beautiful um there's been then there's been work that i've pursued that i've kind of tried to be a little bit more inclusive but i will say that i i do think i just work well with boundaries and when i can kind of as i mentioned before move in and out of certain modes of being so you know I- i'm not thinking about my art that much when i'm with my kids like I, you know i'm i'm really not i think this was my first experience i i i was telling this my partner like you know when um i had children at home and we didn't have them before um this was our first generation my brother had kids and something that i totally love now is how much power children have when you have in like when i go back home i really go back home i i mean if i'm not working and if i'm with them i no matter what's going in my life how bad i want it how bad the situation is or how good it is 
once you're with kids you just with them they consume you and they disconnect you in a way that you know your world and i i really like that about it because i think in a life that we're living today we're so overworked we're always thinking about how how much we've achieved how much we've not done and how what's next constantly on social media posting and like this and that and it's like we're constantly running towards things and it's so all things are running towards us that is so hard to disconnect and i found it so refreshing that how how and how how i think on a whole level how how great that felt and how good that feels today so i think that's amazing yes that's a beautiful way to put it they really they tether you to the present moment i think and you know that's why i i i uh you know i really try to be off my phone as much as possible when i'm with my kids because that that gift of presence is is so rare like i don't get it in other places in my life so that's a a great reminder good do your children understand who what you do do they understand um um you know their mother is an artist um do they understand uh i think it's it's one of the privileges i feel like children who grow around creative mothers or parents i think it's a blessing i had my mom she wasn't as per creative in the sense of you know as an artist but she was very creative and i think a lot of my own influence comes from her and how crafty and you know how creative she was so how how do your children react to that yeah i mean i th- i think it's very normal to them um i think the harder thing to describe is like Well I run a network of online people and they all come you know like it's more the like virtual aspect of you know kind of community building they don't quite understand um which is funny because that's easier to explain to adults like I think you know adults who who are not in the art world they're very like they understand oh you have a podcast much more easily than like Oh, you like make things and like do you sell them? And I'm like, "Well, no, not always." And they're like, "But then what do you do with it?" You know, like that kind of um whereas my kids really understand, "Oh, you made something cool. That's great." You know. Um so it's it's kind of reversed. It's interesting. Oh my god. This was so amazing, Kaylin. Thank you so much for your time. I really really enjoy talking to you. But one last thing before I let you go. uh please take this space and can you can you tell us how can we support you where can we find your work how can we know more about uh thrive artist mother podcast and anything that you want to share with us anything any new project that also you are working on yeah um thank you for asking and you're a great interviewer this was a wonderful <laughs> conversation um thank you. i think Yeah, if you're like kind of looking for that visibility um of being an artist and caregiver, definitely tune in to the other Artist Mother podcast. It's, you know, available and I'm, you know, we release like 2 to 3 episodes a month, so we're still pretty consistent with publishing. Um I also have another podcast that I co-host with Jamie called um The Thriving Artist Podcast and that is like 10 to 15 minute short little episodes really just about a topic kind of a practical tip or like how to plan out your week or how to have a closing routine in the studio um so definitely give that a listen if you want kind of more just like art advice or inspiration um and yeah you know the thrive together network is kind of the virtual community that we run and um we always have something new going on there it's a great place to plug in to uh we'll be really wrapping up you know the year and kind of doing our big push for planning in 2024 so um i th- i think like the biggest thing our community offers other than connecting with you know hundreds of artists is Jamie and I offer planning tools for artists so we have you know a calendar and kind of goal setting activities and all this stuff that can really help you get organized um in the studio and plan for the year ahead. So that's kind of where my brain is at even though it's only September. I'm like, you know, I'm only I'm like, oh my god, 2024. Oh, is it already here? <laughs> it's coming up. 
Um, and then my, you know, my art practice, I actually had a lot of shows early this year. So the rest of the year, I just get to be in the studio and I don't really have deadlines until 2024. So I'm really looking Enjoying forward that to time. having Taking some, that time. Yeah, just just some slower time in there. Yes. Perfect. Thank you so much. It was so nice talking to you. And I really appreciate your time. And I hope to see you soon again. Thank you, Sharika. It was so great to talk to you.